morning. You can go ahead and be seated. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Warner Pacific University in our 2020 convocation. For those of you here in person, thank you for representing our students and our faculty, staff, and board of trustees, since all of them cannot be here with us this morning. For those of you out there watching virtually, thank you for joining us and welcome to what will undoubtedly prove to be a memorable year. For many of you, this is the first ceremonial experience at Warner Pacific, and it must be very different viewing it on a screen than being in the room. But this is one of our ways of wel welcoming you to the university community and some of the elements of our formal academic ceremony. Each year, God gives us the opportunity to celebrate God's presence with us, renew our commitments to God and each other, set our minds on new goals, and start the academic year with a sense of momentum, passion, and engagement. To start us off this morning, Michelle Lang, our campus pastor and adjunct faculty member, will offer our invocation. Again, we come to you at what is the beginning of a new school year for us, but it is not a time that you are not already in. You are the alpha and the omega. You are the beginning and the end and everything that happens in between. Where we count a beginning, you are already here. You are already going before us. You are not surprised by the day or the time or the moment or the situation or the condition or even the terms. And so God, we follow you, the Alpha, the Omega, the creator of all the universe, and he who holds it together. 
And God, we ask that you would just bless not only our time together right now, but even bless our entire uh, year ahead, our entire school year ahead. In these unprecedented, different, awkward, strange, unusual times, God, we rely and depend on you to be the same God. We de de rely and depend on you to be the God that has always been here. And God, it is, in, it is in you we put our trust and our hope. Go with us, walk with us, lead us and guide us. God, we give your name the glory, the honor, and the praise. We respect you with our words, our work, our life, our actions, our activities, even our attitude. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Michelle, and members of our campus worship team. Now we want to bring you some greetings from across the university community. First, introducing the incoming class will be Dr. Molly Smith, Vice President for Enrollment Management and Marketing. And she will be followed in order by ASWPU President, Saman Haji, our staff representative, Nikki Greer, our faculty chair, Dr. Ryan Hubbard, then Greg England, the chair of our Board of Trustees, will bring his greetings and introduce our speaker this morning. Good morning. As part of this tradition, we typically have the new class stand. And I'm going to ask you, wherever you are, would the new class the new students for fall 2020, please stand if you're able, wherever you are, in your residence hall rooms, in the library, around campus, at home. Don't be embarrassed. You have earned this moment. President Johnson, Dr. Goebel, members of the Board of Trustees, and members of the Warner Pacific community, today we add 198 new students to our family. I am truly inspired by these students, and I'm honored to share today about them. They are resilient, persistent, and determined. As we are all aware, 2020 has been a challenging year, especially for students. The students starting at Warner Pacific this fall will bring their personal experiences and make their mark, not just within the WPU community, but in Portland and beyond. 69% are women, 31% are men, 35% are first-year college students, while 57% are transferring, 5 are post -bac students earning a second, 5% are post -bac students earning a second degree. They represent a beautiful spectrum of ethnic and cultural backgrounds. 27% identify as Hispanic, 15% as African American, 11% as Asian American, 50% identify as Caucasian, while there are a myriad of students that identify in addition as a, com a combination of these backgrounds and others. Our new students are citizens of nine countries, including Nigeria, the Congo, Cuba, Egypt, Kenya, Mexico, the Philippines, and Russia. They represent nine U.S. states, with 75% being from Oregon, 15% from Washington, 3% from California and Nevada. The most common names for the incoming class, not Hannah for women, and Joseph and Daniel for the men. They have grown up in farming communities, rural towns, suburbs, and urban cities. Some have shared a room with siblings their whole lives, and if they live in the residence halls, have a room to themselves for the first time. Some will commute, some will have jobs, others will navigate academics and athletics. And as I can tell from having the privilege of reading their applications, these students have already demonstrated care and concern for those around them by serving their families, friends, and communities. In addition, we anticipate over 125 new students will start in our professional and graduate programs this fall. To share the full extent of the data would have me up here for hours. And while I share statistics on this incoming group of students, 
We know that each student is unique and special and cannot be summed up in numbers. Their individual stories are inspiring. Their backgrounds have shaped who they are and their presence here will shape who we are. As they stand, ready to learn from us, we acknowledge that as faculty and staff, we will learn just as much from them. As we mark the official beginning of this new academic year, please welcome these new students. I release them on behalf of the admissions team into your capable hands. May you support them, encourage them, challenge them, and inspire them to all that God calls them to be. It's a beautiful day. Peace be upon you. Good morning to you all and to those who are joining us virtually. I say it's a beautiful day because it's truly a blessing to be here with you all. And I manifest that where today will be great. And I encourage you to start every day with hope and love. And I have a trick and I'll share at the end how you do so. My name is Saman Haji and I am grateful and honored to serve you as a student body president. On behalf of student leaders and I, honored guests, welcome to a new chapter. A story we all, we all have to pen to start and finish this beautiful story of ours. The beauty of our story is that we all come from different paths, different walk of life, backgrounds here I wonder. It allows us to learn and see the world from different lenses while we influence and grow together. You are already enough. You are already enough in the world and wonder loves you for who you are. Don't be loud or quiet just to fit in. Don't resize or water down of who you are just to fit in. Be you. Say it one more time. You are already enough. Be you. Some of you are starting this journey. Others are about to finish. And whether you started your journey, college, experiment, I wonder, or to have transferred in, we all in this strange and exciting time together. I say a journey because this is not a destination. We often think of, oh, we made it to college, yay. But this is just the beginning of what is, the, is about to come. And here's, here's my takeaway for the day. Find your why. College is beautiful, a lot of classes, we're gonna learn a lot about things. But most importantly is our why, why are we here? is gonna motivate us. We don't have to push ourselves. If we know our why, why we doing what we doing, we're gonna wake up in the morning motivated, pulled by it, because we know what we wanna do. Find your why, yeah, thank you. Good morning and welcome. Um, on behalf of the staff here at Warner Pacific University, we are so excited that you are here. Whether you're new or returning, it's a joy to see all of your smiling faces in person or via Zoom. We have missed them dearly. We feel the energy and the life that you bring to this place and it exhilarates us. We as a staff have spent the past few weeks, months, and really this whole year preparing for this very day preparing for you, for the students. And you are why we do what we do, and most importantly, you are why we love what we do. Each of you are from various cities, states, and even countries, as Molly just mentioned. You come with your own unique life experiences, your outlooks, talents, beliefs, hopes, and your dreams. And you're probably starting the school year off with a few assumptions maybe a few doubts or fears of what your college experience will hold. And you may be expecting to excel academically, we hope you do. You may be hoping to join some clubs and participate in campus activities and make new friends that will last your lifetime, all of which are fantastic. You may be hoping to maybe just get done with your degree, maybe never read another book in your life and just get this diploma over with. Um, and you might be envisioning your time stretch between the classroom, work, maybe the gym, 
the field, the auditorium, or the stage which e with each minute of your day scheduled out until you crash in your bed at night. But whatever it is that you're hoping for this school year to hold, and the next four years for those of you who are just starting as freshmen, we want to encourage you to lean into your experiences with your whole self, like Simon just said. I'm sorry, I lost my place. Uh, <laughs> with your whole self and to find a balance even when it may feel impossible. And sometimes it's going to feel impossible. I think we've all learned that this year, that challenges come our way that we don't always expect. It's a given. As humans, we're limited. Um, but as Theodore Roosevelt said, nothing in the world is worth having or worth doing unless it means effort, pain, difficulty. I've never in my life envied a human being who led an easy life. I have envied a great many people who led difficult lives and led them well. Now, I'm not trying to scare you or say that college is going to be the hardest thing you ever face in your life. What I am trying to say is don't expect it to be easy and know that you have support when things are tough. The staff and the faculty are here for you as your cheering squad, as your metaphorical shoulder to cry on right now, um, for words of wisdom and a listening ear to hear. We will diligently work with you and for you to ensure that you leave this place better than you came to it. We, the staff, will be here for you and we will show up for your trials and your triumphs. We can, you can count on that. And I'm not just saying these things as a staff member, although I have a lot of experience in that area. I myself sat in this room many, many years ago as a college freshman filled with nerves and excitement for my own experience here at Warner Pacific. And what I can tell you from my experience is this, expect the unexpected. These years may be in many ways what you expect or assume, but my hope for you is that in many ways they will not be. That you will learn, grow, and achieve what you never thought you could, that you will get out of your comfort zone and challenge yourself to do and be more than not only what you expect of yourself, but what others have expected of you. And when you do, we will be here to celebrate with you. Congratulations, students, and welcome. On behalf of faculty, welcome uh, brand new students, which I believe to be the largest incoming class in the last five to eight years, as well as welcoming back our returning students for the 2021 academic year. Uh, I believe it's a blessing to be able to have all of us back on campus. Uh, it's almost a sense of relief and a sense of joy. Uh, we're glad you have chosen Warner Pacific and I'm glad you've chosen to return. And I believe, and we believe, it's for a reason. Uh, we're in a time of change. And one of the things that I think we could say is we need to embrace change. Um, from the changes we've made through COVID-19, through the changes we've seen in the summer of Black Lives Matter, and moving towards racial equality and social justice. These are changes that are occurring and are going to continue to occur. Uh, since you've last seen us, faculty have been hard at work. We've spent countless hours this summer uh, in trainings, preparing for this time. We've learned new language, new words such as swivel, figs, flipgrid, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, all with the goal to deliver the kind of education that prepares you to engage actively in a, constant in a constantly changing world. Okay. And as part of our vision, too, to have mission-driven leaders to go out and change the world. We believe you are those people. Um, it is, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a time of change. Uh, our world needs you. Okay. Warner Pacific is small in number, but I believe mighty and significant. I'm reminded of Matthew 5:14. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. I see Warner Pacific, obviously not as a town, but as a campus, and we are built on a hill, Mount Tabor. Why not shine? Why, why would we hide? We have no reason to hide. Now is our time to light the world. Do you see what's going on out in our city, out in our country, on, on this planet? What do we need? Oh, we need a lot of things. We need critical thinkers that, are, that can communicate, collaborate to help improve and to help solve the world's issues. We need leaders that, that demonstrate love, compassion, empathy, among other traits. Might you be those people? We believe you can be those and that you will. Thank you.
morning. Well, what a difference a year makes, huh? I mean, just one year ago, we were gathered in this place. We were jammed with new and returning students and faculty and staff and board members and community members. Um, and we all got to hear our outgoing president, Dr. Cook, address us at a convocation for the last time. A year has passed and we're still gathering in this place, although most of you are here virtually, but welcome to everybody and it's, it's still good to be together, even virtually. So as we put a wrap on the last school year and now begin the new year, we are met with new challenges. If nothing else, the faculty, staff, and students of Warner Pacific University are a resilient group. Thank you. The Board of Trustees thanks each of you for your flexibility, accepting the challenges imposed by the pandemic, and for your dedication as we accept present circumstances and work together to move forward. As two public figures recently expressed it, it is what it is. <laughs> and you have all seemingly accepted what is and decided to move forward despite the obstacles. And speaking of resiliency, the eighth president of Warner Pacific University, who I'm about to introduce, and who only recently began his tenor, tenure several weeks ago, epitomizes resiliency. One year ago, Dr. Johnson was commencing another academic year as Vice President Senior Campus Administrator at Mercy College in Manhattan, New York. He was not formally appointed by the board until June. He was the overwhelming choice of the search committee and the Board of Trustees overwhelmingly voted to appoint him. He and his wife, Shamika, were hoping to purchase a home in Portland before their relocation but time constraints and the challenges of the Portland housing market have made that difficult. And so they ended up renting an apartment in downtown Portland temporarily so they could continue their house hunt close up. And he keeps assuring me how much they enjoy Portland and particularly downtown. And speaking of his resiliency, when he arrived on the, uh, August 1st, we didn't have his office ready for him. So while his predecessor had vacated, he waited patiently while a new coat of paint and a new carpet were installed. And I believe he finally took occupancy, what? Yesterday? Yesterday? So, so I know he's pretty happy about that. Um, and he's hit the ground running. He, he has had group and one-on-one -on -one meetings with the executive cabinet and is involved in the day-to-day -day briefings as they involve the university's planning regarding the pandemic. He's, I know it's a cliche, but he's truly drinking out of a fire hose. Um, last week, he spoke at a virtual faculty retreat, at a virtual all-employee welcome, and in person to a meeting of new faculty and staff at their orientation, along with a lunch for student leaders. And he plans to spend a lot of time over the next several months uh, doing a lot of listening and getting to know all of us. Prior to his administrative position at Mercy College, he was the president of Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama for three years. His prior service as a university president will be invaluable as he steers Warner Pacific during these particularly challenging times. I've enjoyed my interactions with him over the past several months. And really, I feel like I've known him for years rather than just weeks. Dr. Johnson is humble, he's wise, and he's a man of deep faith and scholarship. Dr. Johnson has a Bachelor of Arts degree in English from Johnson C. Smith University, where he graduated magna cum laude from the Honors College. As are many of our students, he was a first-generation college student. He has a master's at, in English from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his PhD is from the University of South Carolina at Columbia, Columbia, also in English, where his studies were concentrated in 17th century Puritan, 18th century colonial, and 19th century American literature with a minor in African American literature. He's married to Shamika Johnson, who is the senior vice president at Bank of America. And the couple have two sons, Asa, who's 16, and Nathan, who is 15. So students, faculty, staff, alumni, board members, please join me in extending a warm welcome to
to the eighth president of Warner Pacific University, Dr. Jo uh, Brian Johnson. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. Wow, let me just first say thank you to uh, Greg, our chairperson of our University Board of Trustees, who, and his colleagues on the Board of Trustees for entrusting in me the eighth presidency of Warner Pacific University, the opportunity to steward. I am deeply, deeply appreciative of, and I look forward to working alongside of each of you as we begin not only this academic year, but the years to come. I'd like to thank my plenary speakers uh, who joined us today on the platform. First of all, Chaplain Michelle Lang and the wonderful students who joined her in the invocation. I just was simply uh, moved deeply by your voices and I wish to thank you for doing that. Boston Jackson for the professional and the piano. I'm uh, sure I will hear some of that as we recess as well. And I understand you're an alumnus as well, so thank you for that. Dr. Luke Goble, our Vice President for Academic Affairs, thank you for your organization under different circumstances as we are, if you're not here with us visibly here in the McGuire Auditorium, we are spaced out and we are separated by six feet or more, including myself as I speak without a mask. I have the appropriate proximity, so I appreciate Luke for his attention to that. My appreciation for Dr. Molly Smith uh, and the Vice President for Enrollment and the wonderful job of admissions in increasing our incoming class by a whole 43 students, which many more to, to go, I understand, from Molly. So we look forward to the census date and we look forward to the future. Uh, I'd also like to thank Saman, and Saman, I've seen you at a couple of different outings, um, encouraging new students, talking with parents, uh, and you and your student leaders have been wonderful additions, and I've enjoyed seeing you in passing uh, and talking with you and chatting with you and doing more of that in the future. Nikki, um, I understand you're a WPU graduate, or you sat here as well, so uh, I wish to thank you. I did not see your year in the, 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 the program, but I'll make sure that we, we insert that in the future. We appreciate your kind words there. Uh, I uh, processed in directly behind Dr. Ryan Hubbard, who is in sports management, and we had a brief conversation. I thank you and uh, your representation and encouraging words from the faculty. I also wish to, at this time, acknowledge all of you as faculty, staff, and, and students as we begin this year and as you take the time to listen to me. One more acknowledgement that I wish to be very clear and, 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 and expressing is for our seventh president, uh, Dr. Andrea Cook, who has led this institution over the past 12 years and who has been of an immense help of the many meetings I've been engaged in and learning about Warner Pacific University and the many more that I will be engaged in in sitting with you in listening sessions uh, the most important of which initially have been with uh, Dr. Cook and giving me briefings about our COVID planning and our plans for the institution and some things that uh, presidents share with one another that are important as you pass the baton and mantle. And so we look forward to having President Cook with us at different times throughout my tenure here and we look forward to that. With that being said, I will offer my words for the opening of the fall 2020-2021 academic year. And I labored very deliberately and very prayerfully about the scripture and title and what particularly might the Lord want me to share during this time. And the scripture that I wanted to begin with and use as my text is taken from Psalm 84 verse 11 and if you will turn to your program you can read along with me if you like and it reads as follows for the Lord God is a sun and shield the Lord God will give grace and glory no good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly 
And I decided upon that particular verse because it is filled with so many different principles that one can take away. But in particular, giving grace and giving glory. And Psalm 115.1 is, as one of my faculty members asked me in one of our virtual sessions, is, is, is one of my favorite. Because in that particular scripture, it says, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and truth sake. And what's particularly powerful about Psalm 115.1, as well as Psalm 84.11, is that you can rest assured that if there was ever any glory there was first grace. And I assure you that there will be no glory if there is no grace. And so as we think about grace and glory, I chose as my topic and my title, which shall should be listed in the program, Grace and Glory, Navigating, navigating Sacred and Civic Spaces for the Future of Warner Pacific University. And among the biblical personages that I elected to use as a sort of model of navigating sacred and civic spaces is an unusual one. You, if you are not going to read a ton of biblical commentary and a ton of church history, he is a figure who goes by the name of Cyrus. You may read of him in first chapter of Ezra, you can read a little bit of him in Isaiah 45, a little bit in Daniel, a little bit of 46, uh, and, and Isaiah 46 as well. And this figure Cyrus is in particular not only someone of scripture, but uh, Larry Hedrick has translated a text, it's a leadership book of Xenophon Cyrus the Great, and in this tale of Cyrus the Great, he talks about a lot of leadership principles and lessons that many leaders have gleaned to and learned from. But for our purposes today in understanding why I chose him as navigating sacred and civic spaces, it's because here is a unique personage who was foreordained by God to complete a particular mission. In Isaiah 45, it says, I have called you by name, although you have not even known me. I use this as an example because of those who lay claim to knowledge of God in whatever form that is and through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ or whether you're searching and understanding who God is for your own self. Here is a person who did not even acknowledge God but yet was called to fulfill a unique purpose. That purpose in particular was, if you read at the end of Daniel, he organized this, the Medes and the Persians to come against the great Babylonian empire, which held the people of God in captivity. And eventually he issued the declaration that would lead Ezra and Zerubbabel and so many other figures to the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. But with that being said, I first would like to just tell you a little bit about Cyrus and some of the leadership lessons I've learned before I proceed with my text. And once again, we know that during these political times that leadership is very important. The Bible tells us that the Lord himself is the one who sets up kings. He's the Lord himself is the one who removes kings. He's also the one that changes times and seasons. The book of Proverbs, it also says that the, hand of the, the heart of a king is in the, is in the hands of the Lord. He is the one who turns it whatsoever way we will. So in spite of our views on the left or the right or in between or out of the box or wherever you are, be always mindful that it's the Lord himself who sets up men and removes men and changes their hearts and guides their thoughts and decisions. But in the case of Cyrus, there are several leadership principles that I have gleaned from throughout my time in reading about this really important figure. The first of which is that he declared the end from the beginning. And I, if some of you follow me on social media, I will oftentimes reference Larry Hedrick's uh, Cyrus the Great because he has this quote where he says, putting my hand on my hip, I am telling you from the beginning that we shall win both honor and wealth and prosperity for Persia and we are going to do it quickly. And that's really a bold declaration and oftentimes when you hear from a university president, you want to know, we want to hear what is the end from the very beginning. 
The other thing about Cyrus was that the group of people that he assembled around him and the selection of individuals, it was not based on their race or creed. Uh, if you read of the histories, bringing together these different small countries that throughout his military campaign, some believed and acknowledged God, some did not necessarily believe and acknowledge God, some were of this ethnic background, some of, was of, of this racial background. And that's important because ultimately he had to understand that in pursuing and moving forward, he wanted the very best. And that best is something I would like to talk a little bit as we talk about grace and glory. And then the third point I wish to make, and if there are any biblical theologians out there, there was a very strong sense that whereas Cyrus did not acknowledge the God of the Hebrews, he certainly was very much aware of a divine sense of purpose. And at, at the very least, I should think that all of us, no matter where you are in particular in knowing who you are and discerning the will of God for your life, that you will essentially have some inkling that something bigger, something in particular, and there is some reason here uh, that you've been placed for. And as I shared with our student leaders the other day, Ralph Walter Emerson, when he makes the point that if a man or a woman indomitably place himself upon his instinct and there abide, eventually the whole world will come around to him. And that instinct, that sense of inner knowingness, I believe is, in many ways, the Lord identifying with us and speaking with us. And it's this very sense of understanding his unique, great grace and purpose that I wish to share three principles for us here as new incoming students, continuing students, our staff, and our faculty here at Warner Pacific University as we walk out our unique gifts and callings in the particular sphere we have been called to to attain grace and glory, navigating sacred and civic spaces for the future of Warner Pacific University. Each of us have a unique purpose and grace to fulfill during our time here on this earth. And no time is more present than right now for the future of Warner Pacific University. In 2 Timothy 1.9, it is uh, written by Paul to, in his letter, it is God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the war began. It is said that with the life of Cyrus that this calling was one by which the prophet Isaiah had acknowledged even before he had been named Cyrus. And of course, according to various histories, Cyrus was a name that was adopted in the lineage that he existed in. But gradually, over time, as he's growing into becoming a leader, he sort of hears of these prophecies. And whether that's in his planning to overthrow the Babylonian Empire, or whether it was a true sense of divine calling, he had heard in some uh, histories that that, you know, that I've been called to overthrow this particular uh, 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 group of nations in order that there might be a people that's freed. We all have a sense of how we've come to learn about our own purpose and grace, whether it's through prayer, and some people would say whether it's through confirming words that's spoken over your life, or whether it's uh, in some ways confirming of the particular unique gifts and callings upon your life. But without question, understanding one's purpose and grace in particular is one of the most important things that I would urge each of us from the president to our faculty, our staff, to particularly our students to labor in a evolving and ongoing way about what is your unique purpose in grace. And particularly for here at Warner Pacific University, Cyrus's purpose in grace was in arguably some terms a very selfish one in, in terms of the civic sphere during the time he was at war 
kings like to conquer and kings want to win campaigns. And there is, in that sense, something that mirrors our own lives. We have jobs, we want to support families, students want to obtain credentials, faculty members want grant monies, presidents want to secure monies from all over. And in some ways, that is a very tangible, uh, a realistic place that does not have, as it were, the sacred dimensions of of what we sometimes labor in when we're in our individual prayers. They are tangible, they manifest themselves in not only your prayer room, but they manifest themselves openly. And in some respects, when Cyrus is overthrowing the Babylonians and releasing some of the treasures back to God's people, it served a practical purpose for him. He was able to feed his men. He was able to, uh, to have his own coffers filled. But what I'm asking us to think about with this figure Cyrus is that ultimately the call upon his life was a far larger call than simply the activities of a king. He was called to play a particular role in releasing his people from captivity so that they could rebuild his temple. And each of us, regardless of our different activities that we engage in throughout the day and throughout our lives as fathers, as mothers, as teachers, professors, administrators, we have to be very mindful of the purpose and grace that only you can, uh, how should I say, you can only speak to. I uh, believe that everyone ought to have a, a personal mission statement, and that mission statement may be available that you would share with others, but most importantly, it's important that you share it and remind yourself of it each morning. I have my own personal mission statement. And as you operate and labor in whatever field of endeavor, as minor as it may seem, know that it's driven by a divine purpose, that it's driven by a divine grace that we ultimately may or may not see during your lifetime, but that as long as you are aware of it, as long as you access it, and as long as you're keenly thinking about this is the unique place and role that I'm serving at this moment in time for God's purpose and grace, it's an important one. The second point, which is closely correlated to the first is, each of us must properly steward over and manage the grace of God upon our lives for the future of Warner Pacific University in both safe and civic spaces. First Peter 4.10 is one of my favorite scriptures and as you will increasingly hear, it's uh, every scripture, it's one of my favorite scriptures. As every man hath received the gift even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Stewardship, this is a term that we hear a great deal. Uh, it, he goes on, and, and Peter, in writing, if any man speaks, let him speak at the oracles of God. If anyone serves, let them serve with their heart. But in particular, each and every one of us have been endowed with, whether it's grace of talents, grace of skills, the grace of a role, the position that you occupy, that you and you uniquely must be able to fulfill. And I find that stewardship in the gift is one of the most liberating, most powerful uh, as, uh, attributes that one can uh, come to understand about their lives in addition to the purpose and grace that's upon it. The stewardship of your unique gifts. Uh, there is a book that was titled and still titled Courage and Calling, which is a book that I will recommend by Gordon T. Smith. And he talks a great deal about, I don't like to refer to individuals as having strengths or weaknesses. I say this all the time. You have strengths or non-strengths. Why is this the case? Because one does not say to a dolphin that can't climb the mountain that that particular dolphin is somehow has a weakness in climbing. One does not say to a bird, although there are all types of amphibious mammals who can fly, but you do not say to a bird that can't swim to the depths of the ocean that he or she does not have the grace to swim in an ocean. That dolphin, that bird, that mountain goat that cannot swim are, are uniquely endowed with particular graces that they work hard and very diligently at. And so students and faculty members uh, and, and staff 
we must take heed to how we view ourselves and how we view others in relationship to us so that when you see someone singing with the joyous gifts of God that I've just heard on this stage, it is very important for me not to covet after that gift. As I will tell you, my friends and family will say that I would, uh, the Lord knew not to give me the grace of singing because I think that I would probably be so lifted up that I, uh, it would be a very difficult thing to see me be able to manage myself knowing that I could walk around and sing like that because I would do it all the time trying to attract attention to me. I can't sing at all. That's not my unique grace. But as I hear you and invoke the spirit of the Lord here, I did not at once think, oh, I wish I could cover after that grace because I knew that it was my job to uh, deliver a particular burden later on in this uh, ceremony. And so as I talk with incoming students, as you compare yourselves one to another and you see someone operating in a particular grace, what I always try to labor to encourage you to do is to think about the unique grace that's upon your life and you work that grace. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ told us that he, or it was written of him that he came in grace and truth, but he gives us grace for grace. And one of the things that I note about stewarding over grace is that the Lord tends to multiply that grace upon your life. And even as we talk about sacred and civic spaces, we'd like to not only have grace for grace, but we'd like to have grace and the accompanying glory that goes with it. Because as you are stewarding over your unique role, your unique position, oftentimes more comes as you are entering into that particular space of understanding, not only the purpose and calling on your life, but that particular grace. And its application for us in sacred and civic spaces is that, you know, if you're an artist, yes, we'd like to have you in McGuire doing praise dances and worship, but if the Lord calls you to a jazz festival and you have the door open to operate in that particular gift, by all means go. Our faculty members, if the Lord has laid on your heart a wonderful book that you pray will be used in some way to bless the body of Christ, um, see if he also has something for others as well, because I believe that the, the blessings of God are, are not with, without respect of persons. And you will find that as uh, Dr. Hubbard, I believe, Ryan has indicated, that we are a light that's set on a hill and the graces that are endued in each of us are not limited to a particular constituency. In the book I've been talking about the coming of the Lord, he said it's too light a thing for you to raise up the tribe of Judah and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I'm gonna make you a light unto the Gentiles so that my glory will be seen throughout the earth. So as you steward over your unique grace, I'm asking you to steward it in such a way that you see that grace operating within our community, but that you operate that grace in other communities that will be both sacred and as well as uh, civic. And lastly, the third principle is one that is a, a, a practical uh, principle in understanding the grace of God in our lives and how it can benefit, benefit us. And it's as follows. Each of us must test and prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God for our own selves. And we must do this for the future of Warner Pacific University in sacred and civic spaces. In Romans 12, 2, a particular scripture that has guided me for much of my life, it reads, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I go back to the gift of singing. I suspect that at some point, someone has actually confirmed that particular calling on your life. It's been proven. She has been asked to come back again to sing. <laughs> um, I know that we often spiritualize a great many things that we ascribe to the Lord, but I found that testing and proving the good person pleasing perfect will of God is something that we ought to 
be mindful of. It's not the testing in terms of fleecing, but it means testing, okay, I kind of feel like I might be able to write, or I might be able to research, or I think I do have this administrative skill, or, uh, skill, or I have seen a test and it says that I'm this. Well, at some point, that's going to be confirmed. Um, it's going to be proven. It's, and it's not so much proving outwardly, but most times it is, which is in what I would like to argue is uh, what manifest gl glory is. It's something that everybody can see, like it's not a private matter. You see, uh, if you can see one day somebody somewhere will say, yeah, you, you're a pretty good singer. And if you are a great mathematician or you're great at being in campus police and you're great in facilities and we have wonderful people, uh, Daniel who did a wonderful job, uh, Dean who did a wonderful job in setting my office up, you know, someone is going to come by and say, you know, you did a really wonderful job with that. And, and in your mind, you know that you're testing, you know, I believe the Lord has graced me to do this well. And it's been affirmed. It's been outwardly confirmed, some sort of uh, demonstration of that. And why is that important? Because as we test and prove the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God, as we move into sacred and civic spaces, we want to see, um, as it were, confirmation of our efforts. Um, we know that faith without works is dead, but uh, the sense that what we do and we acknowledge and we speak within ourselves, whether it's in your sacred prayer closet or in our own limited community, somehow individuals can see that glory without. And I was sharing this in, or uh, the other day, and Ryan, I allude to you again. Warner Pacific University uniquely may be one of the smallest institutions in this country and in this world. But in many ways, it is the most distinctive and the most rare of all c colleges and university in this world. You tell me of any other Christ-centered, diverse, ethnically and racially diverse, any institution that's situated in proximity to a metropolitan environment, any institution who cares about social issues and as we regretfully and ruefully understand that another life has been, um, uh, been not, thank you Lord, not been taken, but Devin Blake who was shot seven times in Wisconsin. But you show me another institution that embraces socially progressive issues as well as maintaining its sense of identity. And I'll, I, I, I won't know of any other that looks like Warner Pacific University. And as we go into civic spaces, I intend, along with all of my colleagues, not at executive cabinet level alone, but our board members and faculty and staff, as well as our students, I tend to prove this. I, tend, I will attempt to test and prove this notion that the unique grace that our campus have been, has been afforded in stewarding over this rich tapestry of not only diversity, but a uniqueness that I don't believe is duplicated anywhere else in this nation is a charge that each of us has. And it's gonna happen in a multitude of arenas. It's gonna happen in churches, it's gonna happen uh, in university halls, it's gonna happen in uh, certain organizations and communities that we partner with, it's gonna happen with certain speakers, it's gonna happen and in many ways like the figure of Cyrus. It's gonna happen through people who may not even know why they're being used to support our institution. What I'm asking you to do is to think very deliberately about grace and glory and navigating these sacred and civic spaces uh, in, at Warner Pacific University because I believe it's our challenge not only for this year, but I believe it is our challenge going forward for the years to come. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to listen to me. God bless you all, and God bless Warner Pacific University. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for those words of encouragement to really discover, explore, steward 
develop and offer our grace. Thank you, and we look forward to doing that with you this year and, and years to come. Would the audience stand and remain standing now for the alma mater in benediction? You're going to have to sing nice and loud to represent all the important out there. I invite Michelle back up to do this and that. time in our ceremony to make it official, so I declare the official opening of Warner Pacific University's 84th academic year. I would like to invite up Akela Giles, our student chaplain, to give us the benediction, after which the faculty will process out of McGuire, followed by the board, then staff, and then students. <laughs> 